All right, so now what we want to do is uh, look at some of these elements and start to put them together. Uh, start to build some of those molecules, the molecules that would be building the cells themselves. Carbon is going to be our central element for the majority of our biological molecules. So whether we're talking about sugars, whether we're talking about lipids, whether we're talking about proteins, DNA, or RNA, carbon is going to be at the core. So this is really what we want to start off with. And we're going to look at this in, in two different ways. And I'm going to show you how to draw this. Um, and again, in a chemistry course, you would go into this in more detail with more background. But we're going at the essentials of what you really need to know to look at the molecules in the cell and how they actually function. So for a carbon, we already started to do this. So we can do it a little bit quicker. Six is the atomic number. So we have six protons. That defines it as being carbon. We're not drawing the new the neutrons right now. We're not really doing anything uh, much with them. So they're there. They're just invisible. All right. Six electrons, right? So that means we have two electrons in what we call a first electron shell. But they're six. So that means we have four more. So that means we have to do a second electron shell. And in that second electron shell, there are four more electrons. Now, remember how many total electrons would it take to fill that shell? It would take, it would take eight, right? Eight maximum electrons. And we have four electrons. So, you know, it's either half, half empty, half full, uh, but it's, it's half. It's not, it's not, you know, it's somewhere just in the middle there. Does that mean anything? You know, so what does that, or what does that mean? Well, we have this other concept here. And it's really going to be really important for you because it's going to help us understand these other concepts about bonding, whether we have an ionic bond, a covalent bond, if the covalent bond is a polar or a non-polar covalent bond. These are all going to be things you'll need to define. You'll be able to define those and explain each of them and why. So if I give you a specific element, um, show you another element next to it and say, what kind of bond would they form? Would it be ionic? Would it be a polar covalent bond? You would know, but you would also just be able to explain why, not necessarily from memorizing it, but from actually explaining the reasoning behind it. And the reasoning really comes from electronegativity. So what is this? It's the tendency of one atom to pull on electrons from other atoms. Now, I wrote atoms here, and those atoms could be of the same element, carbon pulling on other carbons, or they could be other elements. So it could be a carbon with a nitrogen or a carbon with a hydrogen or a nitrogen with a hydrogen. It doesn't matter, but all elements are going to interact with other elements except for, I have not drawn up here, but on, the, on a periodic table, on, on the far side of the periodic table uh, is a list of the inert gases. All right, and so we have like helium, Neon, argon, radon, krypton, they go along the side of the periodic table. Uh, they are there because their shell is full. So, so for helium, for example, it has two protons, it has two electrons. That first shell is full with two electrons. That's it, it's full. It doesn't need any more electrons. It's not going to try to get electrons from anyone else. It doesn't interact with anyone else to try and gain electrons. It doesn't want to lose those electrons. It just is. Okay, So it's inert. Right? The other elements of the periodic table are lacking. Their shells are not full. And the ability of them to try and fill those shells is electronegativity. And it is what creates all the different types of chemical bonding. So... This is that's the why. You know, why do elements interact with other elements? It's to fill up this shell. And they are then most stable when that shell is full. So if this carbon has four, right? I did this before, has four electrons, it can have eight maximum there. So essentially it needs four more electrons to fill the shell. 
All right, so if it's going to fill that outer shell with electrons, it needs four more. Another way of drawing this, a little more simplistic way in the way um, I'll, I'll tend to draw these, maybe more so for you, uh, and you should try to draw them, is something called a Lewis dot structure. In your chemistry class, you'll, you'll cover it. So we'll actually use the letter then for the element. Uh, and then all we're going to do is just put little dots. One, two, three, four dots. Those four dots represent these electrons in the outermost shell. Right? They're also called valence electrons. We know that it needs four more electrons. That means it can form four bonds. Okay. And that number, that four, four it can form four bonds. I messed that up a little bit there. Um, that's going to be key because each of these elements are going to form typically different numbers of bonds. The different numbers of bonds are going to relate to the complexity of structure. So if you have, say, a, a Lego piece and it only has little studs on the top, you can build upward. But there are some Lego pieces that have studs on the top and on the sides. That means you could build top and sideways. And there's others that have pieces on multiple sides and you can build in multiple directions. So carbon is our key core element partly for that reason. Partly because it's very abundant, uh, but also because it can branch in all these different ways. Some of these other elements will find that they can't do that. Right? They're, they're more limited in how uh, they can be developed into molecular structures. So carbon needs four. It's going to form four bonds. We'll start off with hydrogen to add into it to keep it simple. All right. So hydrogen, remember, had one proton. That was it. And then it has one electron. And that's hydrogen. Okay, so we could also do hydrogen as hydrogen, and then we'll just put the one dot because it has one electron, it, but it's the first shell, right? So it only needs one more. So if we take these two atoms, a hydrogen atom and a carbon atom, and put them together, so we bring this hydrogen over here. That's the hydrogen's electron. This is the carbon's electron. What's going to happen is now they're going to share the electrons. Sharing of electrons is what we call a covalent bond. All right, so a covalent bond is where two atoms are going to share electrons. They could be different elements or they could be the same element. So it could be two carbons, right, for example. Uh, and so I'll, I'll do one. I'll do another carbon over here just so we can see it. Um, so this carbon would have one, two, three, four electrons. And then this would be the you know, sharing right here going on. So that's the covalent bond between the two carbons. For this hydrogen, it's done. Right? It doesn't need any more electrons. Two is the maximum it can hold. So once it gains that, that other electron through sharing, right? once they share those electrons, that's it. That's it. That, car that element's done. But the carbon here, let's say we formed a bond with this carbon. So now these two are here, but there's two lone ones that need somebody else. You know, we need four... Or we need uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can have eight maximum. They still need two more. So if we fill them in with other hydrogens, just to make it simple, then that's sharing here, sharing there. Okay, so now this carbon, if we look at this carbon right here in the center, this carbon would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Whoops, I can't, I didn't count it right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go, eight electrons for that particular carbon. That would be in the outer shell, which means it's full. This hydrogen has two in its outer shell, which is only the first shell, but that means that's full. So they're done. And so are these hydrogens and so forth. You're not going to have extra bonds attached to those hydrogens. They don't they don't need any other electrons. They, they don't have any other shells. That's just not going to happen, right? So that those hydrogens, once they get to that point, 
uh, of having that one bond, that's it. So what we're going to find is that for each of the elements here, they can only form a certain number of bonds. The number of bonds they form is going to be based on the number of electrons they need. Okay, so they're going to pull on electrons from other atoms to fill these shells. And I'll, I'll put the other hydrogens maybe in here just to say, okay, we could just let's just fill this out. Hydrogens and carbons alone are first two elements. And, and many of our biological molecules, sugars, lipids, especially lipids, uh, amino acids and proteins, DNA and RNA have mostly carbons and hydrogens. The lipids themselves are often majority of the molecule is hydrocarbon, which essentially means it is carbons and hydrogens. That's it. And then there's like an oxygen somewhere. So just this little bit right here, getting this down is going to give you the majority of the structure of most of the molecules, right? That's what we're going to, so this is the, this is the start. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about uh, before we, we shift into another, uh, other elements and put them up here, uh, is the pull, the pull itself. Is the pull, the question would be, is the pull equal? Does a carbon pull on electrons from the car other carbon equally? And we'll start off there. Well, they're the same, they're the same element, right? They have the same number of protons, the same number of electrons. So their sharing of electrons should be equal with one another. Okay, so that's equal sharing. And equal sharing is what we call nonpolar, which in some ways is strange to start off with that because it's by definition not polar. And if you don't know what polar is, then uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot yet. Okay, but it, but it will. It will mean more later. So we call these specifically nonpolar bonds are the bonds where the electrons are shared, but they're shared equally. So always the rule is going to be if it's the same element carbon and carbon, hydrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen with nitrogen. The two elements that are the same are always going to share equally. Now, different elements, that's the key. You'll have bonds between hydrogens and nitrogens, oxygens and hydrogens, carbons and, and, and so forth, different combinations of the bonds. Typically, in almost all those cases, whenever you have two different elements, because they're different, they're not the same, they're not going to share equally, so they're going to be unequal, except in the one case I drew up here on the board. Um, hydrogen and carbon, when they share these electrons, they also do it equally. You might say, well, that's that might seem weird. You might say, what is it that affects the pull? So that might be a question to, to, to answer right now. Say, what affects the strength of the pull? How strong does one elect one atom of one element pull on electrons from another element? Well, there's no simple answer. It's that there are many factors that affect it. Electrons, remember, are negatively charged. What's going to pull on something negative? Other negative things? The electrons? No, they would actually repel each other. The neutrons. Well, the neutrons have no charge. They, they're not involved here at all. But the protons are positive. Positive attracts negative. So it's really the protons, the number of protons that's going to have the first effect on electronegativity. So electronegativity is going to be affected by uh, the number of protons. That's one of the factors that affects electronegativity. So six protons to one, it would seem like carbon's the winner. It seems like carbon would pull more on the electrons from hydrogen if we're talking about strength of the pull. But there's more to it than that. The other uh, is... closer to full. So I'm going to get a little rhyme there. Uh, the strength of the pull is affected by how close they are to being full. So we could say hydrogen 
only needs one more, and it's full. Carbon needs four more, and then it's full. So this one, hydrogen, needs fewer electrons. So we could say, hey, maybe it's closer to being full. This one has to gain more. So hydrogen would be stronger, you know, in that case. The other way to look at it would be, though, that has one out of two, one electron out of two max. Well, here in this outer shell, we have four electrons out of eight max, right? And that's the same as one over two. So that might say, whoa, they're, they're actually equal, maybe, in, this, in that sense. So who, who's closer to being full? Mm, they're, both about ha they're both half full, technically, if we go it that way. So on one case for protons, we have carbon as the winner. For closer to full, technically, they're, they're the same, uh, even though the numbers are different. So what else? There's one other factor that, that's really important here. And that other factor is number of shells. Why are the number of shells so important? Well, if we go back to protons, protons are what pull on the electrons. So the number of them will matter, but also how close you are, right? If you take two magnets and put them near one another, you can often feel the attraction between the two magnets. The further away they get, you feel no attraction or, or much less attraction between them. Closer, you can feel it. Further away, it diminishes. The distance, the distance between the electrons and the protons is going to affect electronegativity. So these electrons here for carbon, which are in the second shell, are further from the nucleus. So that means their attraction is weaker. Even though there's more protons here, there's less attraction because they're, they're further away. Here, there's only one shell. So these electrons are really close to the nucleus, so there's a stronger pull on them. When we factor in all these things, Carbon and hydrogen, even though they are two different elements with some different numbers of shells and, and very different uh, looks to them, they share equally. Right? They, they, carbon shares electrons with hydrogen almost the same way that it does with another carbon. So these are both examples of what we would call nonpolar or equal electron sharing. What we're going to do next is look at some examples here where we have unequal electron sharing. And then we're going to form the, the ionic bonds. After the ionic bonds, uh, we'll, we'll be coming back to then looking at this last part here with the um, polar and hydrogen bonds, you know, in, in more detail. Okay.